All right, welcome. Uh, this is Tuesday, uh, Tuesday at Knox Makers. We uh, do start off with a show and share. That's where you can show off projects, what you're working on, what you've completed, you want to show off. Maybe you failed on it and want to give us uh, lessons on that. Uh, we have a sign-up sheet for our show and shares, and so we're going to start off with Aliki, who's going to show us Needlepoint. So apparently, I've been needlepointing so much in the audience that I've been asked to do more needlepointing as a show and share. So um, as John Dale stated, my name is Aliki, and if you don't know, that's really, really, really Greek. Um, so I'm named after several grandparents, and uh, when you're Greek, and I used to spend my summers in Greece, uh, you're not allowed to grow up without knowing how to do at least seven different kinds of needlework, or you will fail as a grown-up, apparently. Uh, I failed at cooking, so I really hit the needling hard because I can't cook. Uh, thankfully, Joe can. So the one that I'm working on right now, which is what you guys have been seeing, is um, this one's for me. And I'm trying to make it where you can't see right through it because obviously most of it's not done. Can't really tell from the front. It's a stamp. There are several different companies that make these all over Europe. Uh, my favorite are the ones that say made in Greece because, of course, um, uh, but uh, I like to see the different colorful ones as a grown-up, but you'll see a whole slew of ones that my grandparents helped me pick out. Um, and uh, I wanted to show you a little bit more. I'm getting faster at these, and it is just needlepoint with uh, DMC threads. Uh, one of my oldest ones, uh, it's my favorite. Brought a couple here. So when I was 12 years old, these other ones, one I had been working on already, which was this guy here, which I did eventually finish, but I was still in the middle of this one when I picked this giant one up. And she said, Aliki, you're going to be in your 50s when you finally finish this. She lied. I was in my 30s, not my 50s. Um, and uh, I finally, I found this one, and it was like some little itty bitty bit, but I was really proud to finally finish this, and I was really glad uh, that I finished it she was able to see that I did in fact finish it and I was not 50. So it is, um, I will say one more thing about these guys here. According to my grandmother, the back should look as pretty as the front. As you can see, I failed the back. So the back is not as pretty as the front. You'll see all sorts of threads. And my favorite on the older ones is when you see me going from here all the way over there, back over there, because who wants to touch the thread at this point? I'm a lot less lazy these days than I used to be. And I don't mind passing some of these around. Um, another one that I've done, again, my grandmother definitely had some influence. She likes the ladies. <laughs> um, but uh, all of these are finished and just really waiting for me to figure out who I would want to give it to, put it in a frame, and send it off. So is that your grandmother? <laughs> she wishes. <laughs> um, she was not quite this blonde. We don't make Greek people blonde without some hair dye. But uh, you know, um, she, she definitely liked her. This was my grandmother's pick, which was one of her favorites, which are the nymphs. This is another Greek thing, if you're familiar with Greek mythology. So I had originally planned on giving this to her, didn't finish it in time, probably should have sent that off, I buy a lot of different earmarks for some of this. But it's really fun, it's really just needlepoint by number, and uh, just making sure you get everything nice and even, it looks nice, etc. So. That is my needle pointing. Any questions? Oh, sorry, one more, one more. I wanted to show you what it looks like after we're done. This was another one that was for me, and my husband and best friend took and got it framed for me, and this is one that came in our kitchen all the time. And I used to live in a colder place, so. Do you have to take it to a special place that, that knows how to spread these to be square? Or my whole does a great job. Because the framing part is fairly expensive. I don't like doing cheap frames, and I don't like doing them myself. 
myself either. So if I'm going to go through the couple hundred dollars of making sure it's properly framed and matted, it's going to someone's probably. How many months would it take to do something like that? <laughs> 12-year-old a leaky, 30-year-old a leaky, or today a leaky? Today. <laughs> today a leaky, I, uh, I, I'll tell you, I finished this one, her. Oh, I try not to. Now, I'll say I don't work on one needle point at a time, but do I have 17 other cross stitch, latch hooks, other random? Uh, I, yes, I have a lot of needly crafts that I do. What's the difference between needle point and cross stitch? Cross stitch is a different kind of stitch where you're trying to make the X, and there's a specific pattern that you can follow where a needle point, which I will turn around and let you start passing one of those around, you'll notice that it's not an X. It's just one half of it. I use the entire DMC thread so I don't take and separate it out. For some of the thinner, like this is actually a really small weave on the needle point canvas. And technically I should be removing some of the threads to do it if I can hear my grandmother yelling at me in the background. Um, but we don't do that because I like making sure it looks really thick so you can't see through it. Um, and to me it, it makes a more vibrant needle point when it's done. I don't want to see the holes. but. Uh, a lot of times the stamped cross stitch is a little boring for me for some reason, though doing just going through the two holes works fine, so I don't know. I think I like the fact that there I buy the canvases because I have about seven or eight undone canvases that are waiting for me. Excellent. Any other questions? Okie dokie. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Adam who's going to show Stop the Bleed. Also, I'd like to introduce my lovely assistant, Nada, and my fiance. <laughs> she, she has graciously volunteered to be our test subject, guinea pig, victim, whatever you want to choose. Um, so, backstory behind this. Uh, her and myself are both first responders in Blount County. We're on the Blount County Rescue Squad. Um, and as part of that, I constantly have an eye towards how can I get screwed up today um, in the sense of what is going to put a hole in me or um, what is going to put a hole in somebody else. And I don't know if you've been in the wood shop lately. There's a lot of very sharp, spinny things out there um, that made me concerned for a while. And I always was a little concerned that we didn't have a tourniquet or any kind of bleeding control in our first aid kit. Um, so we had to go for our CPR recertification. Uh, what was it, Thursday? Friday, Friday we went. Um, and our instructor uh, has a little store he sets up uh, just to try to milk every penny out of us. And he had some tourniquets for a good price. So I picked one up in order to stuff in our first aid kit over here. And it occurred to me that maybe a lot of people don't know how to use a tourniquet. So I've got our tourniquet out of our first aid kit, which I am going to torture Nada with. So this is to be used if you have life-threatening bleeding. This isn't, I cut my finger and it won't stop bleeding. This is, I may have gouged into an artery and the bleeding doesn't stop. Uh, your first priority is pressure. That's what you're gonna try first. And if you can get pressure to stop the bleeding, then all's well. Put a towel on it and go to the ER. If that doesn't help, that's when we reach for the tourniquet. So, oh, come over here. Okay. So, when you see the tourniquet, it's going to come in a bag like this. It's entirely self contained and ready to use. Um, and this is exactly how it's going to be sitting in the first aid kit. Can I zoom this out wide? Yay! Okay. Um, so, what you're going to do open the bag, take all the contents out. Feel free to rip the bag if you want. It doesn't matter. These are not multi-use items. And of course, I just took it out a minute ago. Now I can't get it out of the bag. 
Inside the bag, you're going to have a set of directions for if you forget how to use it, and a permanent marker. And there will be a better permanent marker than this in there later, but this is what I stole out of the arts and crafts area last second. So the tourniquet itself is gonna be pretty much ready to use. Just pull it out like this. If you wanna go wide, I don't know where the camera's pointing right now. Okay, so like this, you'll see there's a red handle on it. Red is where you're gonna be using it from. So let's say Nada cut her arm there. All right, come over here. Come over to the side so we can see. Okay. Are we on camera here? You were, we're good there. We were good there, okay. Yay. So be tall. Here, stand, can you, can you stand on this box? Uh, be tall. So what you're going to do is if your cut is here, you're always going to place the tourniquet on the limb above the cut. Don't put it on an elbow or a joint. So for here, I wouldn't put it right there. I'd put it up here on the, on the meaty part of the arm. We're just going to wrap it around the arm, pull the handle, pull it tight, and get the Velcro stuck. So now you see we've got this plastic bit here, and there's a little white piece of Velcro that covers it. Pull the white Velcro out, and you're going to turn this. I'm not going to do it to her because it's going to hurt like a, like a lot. Um, but what this is going to do is it's going to cinch down the tourniquet on that limb. You're going to keep turning this until the bleeding stops. And if you're doing this on yourself, you're going to have a bad time, but you got to do it. If you're doing this on someone else, they're going to have a bad time, but you got to do it. Um, it's going to hurt. Once you get it cinched down to the point where the bleeding stops, you hook the, the plastic in there wrap the white part back around, take the permanent marker, and write the time you put the tourniquet on, on the white part. And then you go to the ER, or call 911. But this is gonna keep you from bleeding to death. There is a myth out there that if you put a tourniquet on a limb, you're gonna lose the limb. That's nonsense, that's a myth. People have worn tourniquets for hours, been just fine. And if it, even worst case scenario, if it came down to it, you're looking at you know losing a hand versus losing your life. So anyway, that's how that works. And then just as a reminder, we do have directions in the bag if you forget how to use it. Here, I'll, pull, I'll wrap it back up. And I'll pass this around so you can get a feel for it. Okay. Sure. Yes. What's your thoughts on Israeli bandages? Israeli bandages are good, but they're good for point injuries. So if I were to run my arm across a bandsaw or something, I wouldn't use an Israeli bandage for that. That's more for like... I got stabbed, I got shot, something like that, where you have a single point of injury. Because injury, what it does is it puts pressure right there on that spot, and then you wrap it up real tight. Um, so that's good. I, I don't know that it would be useful here, because near as I tell, there's not a lot of handguns going off. Um, but if you were like looking at a bug out bag or something where you want to carry emergency supplies, it might be a good idea to stuff one in there, because they're cheap. Anything? Oh, okay. Yeah, we should put one in there. Do you want to turn to get out there too? I can probably get another one. All right. Okay, and I'll pass this around. Feel free to look at the directions, and she stole them. Uh, uh, very useful information. Luckily, we haven't needed that yet, but it's always good to be prepared. Uh, next up, we have Green Hose, who's going to show us a nightstand. Hey guys, so I think it's like almost a year ago now. I made this bed. Here, let's see. Let me zoom in on this, and I think I, I went in depth on this thing. Uh, but I want to point this picture out because you can see these IKEA nightstands that we've been using since college, and I've been trying to rid my entire life of IKEA. So, <laughs> but I did like the design aesthetic of them, so I decided to make my Talking to my wife about this the other day, I'm like, yeah, I've been working on these since Christmas, and I look back on it, and I've actually been working on them for just one month. Uh, it just seemed like forever, because they were quite involved. Can you guys see that, more or less? Um, so I decided to make these with traditional joinery. Can you see me, Billy? Dang it. So I try to make these with traditional joinery, so it's all hand-cut dovetails. It's actually what's called a mitered dovetail, so the front edge of the box here is cut with a 45 so that you can do this bevel or this chamfer on the inside and you don't have a corner piece that falls off. 
I'll show you what that looks like. Maybe I'll show you what it looks like. Boom. Okay. Just so you can see. If you come up here and look at the thing, you'll actually be able to see how the joinery works a little bit more. But you do all of these trapezoidal shaped uh, cutouts on one side. So those are the pins. And then the other side of the box would have the tails on it. Um, and then the leading corner gets this 45 put on it. So you have two 45 mating corners. This board that you see on the top is just a scrap piece, and it's how I actually cut the 45 to truly be 45. So that's how you get proper fitment. And all of this is done just with chisel work, which is kind of cool. Um, on the back, I did a traditional raised panel. So this is just a floating panel. It's 3 quarters of an inch thick, but it tapers at the edges to be about a quarter, 3 eighths, something like that. All of that's hand cut. Um, the legs on this were all made by hand. Uh, they're teardrop shaped, if you look at that, which is kind of cool. Originally, I was planning on turning them, and I cut them tapered on the table saw in preparation for turning, and center drilled them, did the whole thing, and then I found out that our lathe is two inches shorter than the desired length of my ta table legs, so that was convenient. So I ended up totally making these things by hand just with a hand plane, which is kind of cool. Um, the skirt is put together with mortise and tendon joinery. And the drawer, which is kind of cool. So this is, again, all cut by hand. So you have half-blind dovetails here. I doubt you can see this in here. Um, so half-blind here, and then through dovetails on the back side. The drawer bottom is a solid piece of cherry. And I actually never even finished it. Oops. So it's got these two slots in the back side so that I can put a couple screws in the back to hold it in place. And they have to be slotted because this will expand and contract by somewhere between an eighth of an, and a quarter inch uh, in width as the humidity changes and the temperature changes. So it has to be able to move back and forth. And your drawer bottoms are always the thing that fails first. So by never gluing this in and having a convenient way to take it back apart, when it fails, you just pull it out and make a new one. So this just slides straight back in there. So the fitment of the drawers is kind of cool. So if you've done your box correct, everything is perfectly square, uh, front to back, left, right, the whole ordeal. So all you have to do is make a drawer front that perfectly fits into the opening, and then you just scribe that to the back, and then you make sides that fit. Um, then if there's any bowing on the inside, it's just a hand plane on the bottom of your drawer when you're all done and you can get proper fitment. So you don't need any sort of drawer slides. And there's no movement, no lateral movement in that. Um, so it's kind of cool. And then for drawer poles, I just did a leather strap. Let's see if you can see that. So nothing special there, left over from a work project. Um, and they just folded over. I'm not sure that I love them, but I got a bunch of different colors, so I might swap them out uh, before it's all said and done. But anyway, I made two of them. Actually, I made two and a half of them. So when I was making these, I screwed one up. Um, so there's like a chirality to the corners. So I usually make two corners, and then I fit them together. Well, I made uh, one whole box, and then I made the same two corners on another one, so you couldn't flip them around because they have the 45 on one side. So I'm like, okay, well, sweet, I'll just make a, a third one. So I went and got more material, was making the third one, and then I screwed it up as well because I just make the same mistakes again. Um, so then, yeah, now I'm back to two, and I'm really happy with them. So that's what I intended to, and now we got them. Um, it's all quarter sawn white oak which I think is super cool. So quarter sawn white oak is what you use in like whiskey barrels, wine barrels, that kind of stuff. Um, it looks really sweet because it'll look tiger striped. If I turn this up, you'll be able to see that. In uh, the tiger striping that you see, so you'll see there's like grain pattern across it here. That's like the rings of the tree. And then all the tiger striping is what's called medullary rays. So they go from the outside of the tree to the center and you only can see those when you have quarter sawn lumber. Uh, and I just think it looks wildly awesome, uh, so I always try to use it. 
Um, on the sides, last thing I'll show you here. On the sides, you can see them a lot better than anywhere else. Uh, you'll see a little faint mark, uh, top and bottom here. Uh, those are the layout lines, so they're how I know where to cut, where to chisel to, everything like that. You can plane them off to remove them, but I just like them as a maker's touch, so I always leave them. So it just demonstrates and showcases that it was made by hand. Um, yeah, that's what they are. What you got? Uh, what kind of finishing did you do? Oh, I did uh, boiled linseed oil, uh, which is a penetrating oil, uh, and then a paste wax over top. So. It wouldn't be super water resistant, uh, but for nightstands, I don't really care. Uh, and it's a really fast finishing project. So if you wanted to do a table or something like that, you'd probably want uh, like a tongue oil or something that's naturally water resistant. Uh, but that takes like several weeks to do correctly. This was like two and a half days and I was in a hurry to get them done. So, yeah. Do you ever have problems when you're moving clocks inside a, a door inside of a fixed box? Yeah, um, it, they always grow when you finish them, especially when you're using a penetrating oil, uh, which is why I always leave the bottom able to be planed back off. So this one, if you look at it, the bottoms of the drawers are, uh, they look a little bit different than everything else. It's because I had to do two or three passes with a hand plane after I had finished it. So it, it fit, I finished it, it no longer fit, a couple passes. You know, you're taking a thousandth of an inch at a time, so you can really uh, hone in on that like exact fitment that you want, yeah. You mentioned that the veins span the growth, and is that with humidity as a help, or is that with the, the, the oil treatment that you're on? Uh, both, yeah. Because it's, as you're working with the wood, I'm just curious, is there different kinds of woods, and some of them are more expandable, and then some of them are more solid? I mean, as far as, I mean, uh, unchangeable? Yes, um, so if you look at, like the wood database, which is a convenient reference for determining how much something's going to expand and contract. Uh, one species to the next, you're looking from like, you know, six to 12% growth from 100% water content to zero. Uh, when you build a piece of furniture, you're probably building it somewhere between six and 12%, and the fluctuations are probably gonna be like plus or minus two or 3%, providing it's, for the most part, staying in an air-conditioned building. If you were going to go put this outside and let it get rained on, it would be wildly different, but uh, from species to species, it's usually not that much uh, difference between them. The key is to always plan for movement, and if you're using the same material throughout, you never have to worry about it. So something like this, if you plan for it to grow a quarter inch, it'll probably grow an eighth of an inch and you're fine. Well, because the grain is all oriented in the same direction. So they're all expanding and contracting across the grain, and you have cross grain to cross grain. If you'd, have, if you'd have somehow figured out how to do this cross grain to end grain, it would destroy itself within a week, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Really beautiful work. I've really enjoyed the progress pics you've been sharing with us along. Uh, that's all I have for the sign up. Is anybody else bring anything and get and get on the list? No, going once, going twice. All right. Uh, we have a few events coming up in the next couple weeks. Uh, this Sunday is a board meeting. Members are welcome to join in on that if you'd like. Uh, next Saturday is a MIG 101 class. Last I checked, it had one ticket left. So grab it if you want it. The TIG class is at 3 p.m. on the same day. It's already sold out, unfortunately. Uh, beyond next week, we have some wood and laser classes coming up. Those are on the calendar. You can go check those out. Uh, just a reminder to clean up after yourself in the workshop. Uh, we've had a few messes left behind, so make sure you clean up if you make a mess. Uh, we need a volunteer to change the trash uh, as we ask every week. So if someone wants to volunteer for that. What's that? And the filter on the, and the AC, if someone would uh, volunteer to change that as well, please. 
if you're new and would like a tour, uh, you can see someone with a badge, me or someone else with a badge, we'll give you a tour, answer any questions you want. And also a reminder, uh, you know, occasionally we'll have people show up uh, at our door asking for Spark. Uh, Spark lives upstairs, and so if you will be sure to direct them up there, uh, that's where they live. So uh, that's all the announcements that I have. So if we, let's just go out to the shop and play. So.